thank you everyone for hopping on today. Uh, we have a topic that I think all of us, including me, um, are, you know, unfortunately or fortunately familiar with. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about menopause um, hormones, which actually includes men um, and weight gain. This is all something, you know, that we all experience as we age. Um, so it's really important to talk about and really learn a little bit more about that and how we can avoid that weight gain because it is possible. You know, we, we get to that point um, where uh, we think, oh my gosh, it's, you know, it's never going to come off. I'm at that age where it's not going to come off. So I first want to start talking about hormones and aging. It's something that we experience as we get older. Um, we're going to see a decrease in hormones for both men and women. So in men, there's a decrease in testosterone. Um, they don't, uh, men do not uh, experience something like menopause. There's not a defined term for men, um, but there are changes in reproductive abilities. There's height loss. They also experience low bone mineral density um, and they do have hot flashes and sweats um, so they might be uncomfortable at sometimes it's uh, not necessarily to the degree as women where women um, we see a decrease in estrogen and progesterone we'll talk about those two hormones in just a few minutes uh, there's uh, immediate changes that you see are changes in your menstrual cycle you know you go from having one to not having one and um, there's a lots of changes in between those um, time periods there's uh, women who experience hot flashes and sweats uh, hair loss, insomnia, you might find yourself awake or waking up in the middle of the night, not being able to see, sleep through the night. We experience mood swings like a roller coaster, like we've never experienced before. And of course, that dreaded weight gain. What is this weight gain that hangs out around our abdomen? So we're going to talk a little bit more about that and how that, um, uh, uh, why that happens and how we can help with that. So before we get into anything, I really do want to talk about meta menopause. Um, you know, we experience it, we're, we might be going through it, we don't know if we're going through it, so here's a little background on it. There's three distinct phases of menopause. There is something called peri perimenopause, which um, starts about 10 years before the onset of menopause. And this usually happens, um, you know, early 40s to mid 40s, we start to see that uh, transition into menopause, which is this perimenopause stage. There are some instances where women might experience this in their late 30s. Um, and it happens uh, about 10 years before menopause. And so it's about a 10 year process, eight to 10 years for this whole transition. So it's a long time that we're experiencing these symptoms of hot flashes, insomnia, mood swings, and some other stuff that goes with it. Um, in the late stage of perimenopause, we actually see a drop in estrogen and with a rapid acceleration. So if we look at this image here, this is a really basic idea of what happens to our hormones. So we have two hormones, estrogen and progesterone. Um, and those hormones help regulate our menstrual cycle. They help prepare our bodies for pregnancy. They help um, after pregnancy. Um, and so we see that huge decline in um, estrogen. And that's usually where we start to see those symptoms um, pick up those night sweats, the hot flashes, mood swings, um, hunger, uh, food cravings. Um, we still have menstrual cycles during this time. They might uh, change. They might become longer. They might become heavier. They might become shorter. They might become, um, you know, you might have experienced more cramping. You might experience no cramping. Um, so we see these changes and it gets really inconsistent. Um, and then this is also the stage, the perimenopause stage, where we start to experience those things. And uh, I'm sure we've all had that moment where like, what is going on? Why am I all of a sudden like sweating in the middle of the night? Or you're like sitting there and all of a sudden you're like hot and you're like, oh my gosh, I have to take off my sweater and I'm so hot. Um, and experience Experiencing those symptoms. So that starts at this, um, this stage, this perimenopause stage. Uh, next, we transition into menopause. So menopause marks the cessation of the menstrual cycle. Um, and it's uh, marked by no menstrual cycle for um, 12 consecutive months. So one full year with no menstrual cycle. And at that point, uh, you would be diagnosed with menopause. Um, this is also the point where the ovaries stop releasing the eggs and um, most of the estrogen produced um, is um, stopped. And so this is where we really see that, that drop off. Um, following the one year of um, no menstrual cycle, we reached the postmenopause stage. 
Um, and this is going to be the period for the rest of your life after that one year of um, no menstrual cycle. Um, and, and we might uh, see those symptoms of those hot flashes, insomnia, mood swings, all of those actually might subside. There are some cases where women will continue that with those, but for the most part, usually about 55, six years old, you'll start to see those signs and symptoms go away. Next up, hormones, calories, and menopause. This is one of the reasons why we're all on this call right now. We want to figure out what's going on with that weight gain and why we're gaining that weight. Even though, you know, we're still exercising, we're still eating reasonably healthy, you're like, I'm doing the same exact thing that I've always done. Why am I still like either gaining weight? Why is this not going away? Um, and there's a couple reasons for that. So we have some hormones. We have our body has a lot of hormones. These are the four hormones that I'm actually going to talk about um, that uh, relate to menopause and weight gain. So we have two hormones, um, one called ghrelin and one called leptin. These uh, ghrelin is a hunger stimulating hormone um, that's released, um, and that's where you get that sensation of feeling hungry. And then leptin is a hormone that's released to um, help. Uh, tell you that you're full and keep you full. And so as we're going through this perimenopause stage, we start to see an increase in ghrelin and a decrease in leptin. And so what happens is we start to um, feel hungry all the time, our appetite increases, and we'll find ourselves eating more than we normally did before that. And that is because that leptin, that hormone that's gonna keep us full or tell us that we're full and that we're good, um, has decreased. And this is gonna continue to decrease um, all the way through post-menopause. Um, there's another hormone called cortisol. If you've joined me on any of the other seminars, you've heard this cortisol before. Um, chronic stress, um, which uh, is um, can lead to uh, increased cortisol levels, can lead to poor eating and poor choices. Um, that's where we get those high fat, high sugar, you know, kind of comfort foods that we're all looking for um, that make us feel better. And so um, as cortisol mitigating effects of the estrogen decline, this stress adds that fuel to the increase in appetite. So as we get stressed, we're gonna tend to go towards that food because we don't have those higher levels of estrogen. And so as we talk about estrogen, um, we're gonna see a decrease in estrogen. And again, estrogen is one of those hormones that helps regulate our menstrual cycle. Um, it really works with the brain um, and normally it is there as an appetite suppressor. But as estrogen decreases, um, you know, we uh, have an appetite increase. And so there's a form of estrogen called estradiol, which helps regulate the metabolism, regulate body weight. And again, once that estrogen or that estradiol declines, our appetite increases. So again, we're gonna find ourselves eating a little bit more. Um, and then the one last thing that really affects uh, weight gain during perimenopause, menopause, postmenopause is sleep. And again, you've heard me talk about how important sleep is. So the fluctuations in the hormones can affect sleep. So as we see that drop in estrogen, that drop in progesterone, um, we'll see you know, uh, an increase in night sweats. We'll have a tendency to stay awake longer, um, leading to insomnia, uh, waking up multiple times in the night. Um, all of this lack of sleep can, again, lead to those increased feelings of hunger because the next day you're really tired. And we always turn to food when we're really try tired trying to get that energy into our body. So we know what causes that weight gain with those hormones. Um, there are some other factors. It's just not hormonal related um, reasons why we end up gaining that weight after menopause. It's not just because of that. Um, so we do have you know, our hormones. We have uh, the decrease in estrogen. We also have some other hormones called androgens that help and some um, uh, other uh, uh, sex hormones that um, we start to see a decrease of um, that really regulate everything else in our body. There's genetic factors which play a huge part in weight gain um, and ethnicity. Those are two uh, really important um, factors when it comes to gaining weight, um, being able to lose weight uh, after or during uh, menopause. Um, and then the last thing that we actually have control over is these exogenous factors, these outside or external factors. 
Um, one is nutrition. That plays a huge, huge part in nutrition. We'll take a look at that. Um, and physical activity. Um, as we get older, we tend to, um, you know, sort of wander into that sedentary lifestyle where we're not moving as much. Um, and that is uh, plays a factor in our energy expenditure. Um, so all of these play into that increase of body fat um, and that redistribution of fat mass around that abdomen. Um, and so when we are talking about menopause and perimenopause, and we all know this, that weight sits right around our abdomen. And that's that actually happens um, for a few reasons. So as we get into that perimenopause stage, that's that early stage, we see a rapid increase in fat mass and the distribution to that weight around our abdomen. It's very specific um, to aging and to um, the changes in hormones. There's two types of fat that we're gonna talk about. There's something called a subcutaneous fat, which is the fat that's right under the skin um, that sits on top of our muscles. And then we have a fat that's called visceral fat. Um, this visceral fat actually uh, sits around our organs. Um, and it's not good for us. Uh, the subcutaneous fat is what keeps us warm. It protects our body from impact. The visceral fat is something that we want to make sure that we keep at a lower level because this affects um, you know, our heart, our organs, um, and it has some other detrimental effects as that fat increases. So subcutaneous fat and visceral fat um, together um, are correlated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. And this is measured by doing waist circumferences. So if any of you have ever been to the doctor, if you've been in the gym or worked with a trainer, um, you may have had your abdominal um, waist measurement taken. And this is, um, again, really correlated with some um, adverse health effects. And so as we're looking at body composition, we want to you know, really keep an eye on this. And so when um, individuals are classified as overweight or obese, it's really taken this uh, adipose tissue, the visceral and subcutaneous um, fat is taken into consideration for that. So an interesting thing about this abdominal fat, um, once it starts to form in that abdomen, it actually acts as its own hormone releasing organ. So fat has the ability to secrete something called adipokines. Um, adipokines uh, work with um, either suppressing or increasing appetite and uh, feeling of fullness, which is satiety. Um, and so as we um, tend to get more visceral fat in there, more abdominal fat, these uh, fat cells are gonna say, okay, we're gonna release these hormones and then you're gonna start feeling hungry and then you're gonna continue to eat, which is why unfortunately, you know, there's a higher instance of um, individuals who are overweight and who like a higher rate of obesity is because, you know, it, it is uh, this continuous release of these apokines that tell the body to continually eat. Um, so it is not like as simple as saying, hey, just don't eat as much because your body is really creating these um, adipokines that are telling your body to say, hey, we need to eat more. Um, these adipokines really um, you know, play an important role in, in insulin resistance, um, which can lead to type two diabetes and metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is a category you know, that has, um, it's like an umbrella category for multiple um, issues. So we really want to keep an eye on that abdominal fat um, because it can sort of snowball into something um, uh, greater that we don't want to deal with. So why do we need to be concerned with um, this abdominal fat? Um, well, there's an increased risk for cardiovascular disease. Um, and I'm sure you've heard it before, but cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death for women. And this is really seen, you know, post menopause, um, that visceral fat and that abdominal fat, you know, it affects the heart because it surrounds the heart. Um, we have, uh, you know, blockages in our heart. It causes strokes. Um, all of this is, is uh, you know, due to this visceral fat and nutrition and lifestyle. Um, and that includes physical activity. Uh, there's, again, that risk for metabolic disorders, the type two diabetes, uh, dyslipidemia, which is your cholesterol. So you might have higher instances of, uh, you know, that LDL, which is the bad cholesterol and lower HDL, which is the good cholesterol. Um, and this all can lead to hypertension. So if anyone has high blood pressure, any issues with that, um, you know, we want to take a look at uh, what you're eating, that physical activity um, lifestyle and really start helping reduce that abdominal fat. 
Um, this also leads to an increase of certain um, risk of cancers. So breast cancer is really big um, and uterine cancer. These are really affected by that abdominal weight gain. And, you know, on top of all that, you know, as an individual, as a person, when you're looking in the mirror, we see, you know, our body, we have like emotional and psychosocial, like mental health issues related to how we feel about our body and how we feel in our own skin. So, you know, if we're uncomfortable with our body, it's gonna lead to anxiety. It's gonna lead to, you know, um, unhealthy relationships with food. It's gonna be leading to like all of this, um, you know, am I able to eat this? Can I eat this? And all of this added extra stress that we don't need. So really important to sort of kind of narrow everything down and keep it in control. There are some important strategies for weight management. Um, and when we're talking about weight loss, we uh, the first thing that we always talk about is calorie intake. So what you're eating, what you're consuming versus calorie expenditure, and that's what you're burning. So if you're you know, sedentary versus physically active, um, and this is the most important for thing for weight loss. This is really like the basic foundation. If you're burning more calories than what you're taking in, you are going to lose weight. And so for women who are in that perimenopause stage, um, it's really important to sort of get on top of nutrition and physical activity before we get to that post-menopause stage so that you can um, you know work on it for the next 10 years and kind of keep it in order for those of you who are already post-menopause this is where we get that chance we really take a look at what you're eating and really how much you're moving um, as i mentioned earlier um, as we age we tend to move less and so moving is going to be a really big important part um, and then again making sure that we're eating the right foods for what our body needs. Um, another really important strategy for weight management is adherence and consistency. Um, those of you who I do work with as far with nutrition coaching you know it is practice 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 practice. Um, I always like to use the example of um, as we're learning something um, and we're trying to get really good at it, um, you know, playing a guitar, we can't just pick up a guitar and, you know, rock out to Led Zeppelin song on the very first try. We have to learn how to do it. Um, and that's the same thing with nutrition. Um, it's the same thing with physical activity. We have to like keep doing it over and over and over again until, you know, it sits in and it's that habit. So it's a lot of practice. It's a lot of hard work. It's not easy to, to you know, work on that nutrition after we have 40 years of eating a certain way. Another thing that um, needs to be evaluated is the food composition. Um, so it's going to be a whole unprocessed foods versus processed foods. Um, you know, when you're looking at fruits and vegetables, there's uh, maybe not a lot of fat in it, but if we're looking at Oreo cookies and gummy bears, um, then that's where we're like, oh, wait a second, this is a lot of sugar, there's some fat in it. Um, those really do affect uh, you know our body composition especially when we're aging so it, it we, we don't get the luxury of eating like a teenager who can eat everything because their metabolism is so high uh, we really do you know need to keep an eye on portion sizes we need to really be mindful about what we're actually consuming um, and then this takes us to the micronutrients and macronutrients and you've heard me mention these before so the macronutrients are your big basic groups the carbohydrates the proteins, the fats, and then your micronutrients are going to be your vitamins and minerals. Um, percentages change as we get older as far as the carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Um, just as an example, um, as we're going through that childbearing stage, we um, actually need a little bit more fat to help with you know, the process of childbirth and um, you know, growing a baby inside. Um, so your fat intake is a little bit higher. As we get older, you know, things need to change. Um, the same thing with protein. As we age, we begin to lose muscle mass. Um, so protein becomes really important. Protein is really important for bone mass and maintaining bone uh, mineral density. Um, again, when we look at micronutrients, those are your vitamins and minerals. You've probably heard a lot of talk about vitamin D and calcium for osteoporosis um, or osteopenia, which is you know um, a result of you know. Uh, bone loss as we age. So as we get older, we start to see this, especially um, after that post-menopause stage, we see a rapid decline in that bone loss. Um, and a lot of you have probably had bone mineral density scans. Um, so uh, again, these uh, vitamins uh, and minerals, calcium and vitamin D are really important. Um, again, I'm gonna go back to sleep and stress management. You've heard me talk about these two, how important they are for weight loss. 
sleep, you really need your body to recover um, in order to, you know, repair the muscles, um, help with immune function. Same thing with stress. We really want to make sure that we keep those cortisol levels in check um, for that as well. And then the last thing I'm going to help with, um, I know you've all listened to this and you're like, yep, this is me. This is like, I have this, I have this, I have this abdominal weight that I just can't get rid of. I'm running every day. I'm doing fit track high intensity sessions five times a week. I think I'm eating okay, so why do I still have this? So we know that problem is that weight gain during, again, it starts at that perimenopause stage, um, all the way through menopause and then even post-menopause where it becomes a little bit more difficult. Um, and that's caused by hormones, it's caused by change, it's aging, um, it's caused by calories. Remember that calorie intake versus that calorie expenditure. And then again, your lifestyle, how much are you moving? How active are you? Um, and these lead to, you know, that increased visceral fat. That's that fat that's around that abdomen that we really need to correct. So we don't have those increased risk for cardiovascular disease or increased risk for ca cancer. Then we also see that increased rate of osteoporosis, which is really important for maintaining that bone health. Um, so as we age, we can still be really strong. Um, so this is where I sort of come in as that nutrition coach. Um, I work with everyone on implementing healthy food habits. Um, I know some of you out there already work with me on it. It's a lot of practice. It's a lot of me checking in. It's a lot of you telling me like, hey, this is what's going on. Um, and again, I work on that cognitive restructuring. We have, you know, years and years worth of eating habits. We really need to break those neural connections and rechange them, reset them and say, okay, here you go. We're going to do this. Um, and I always like to use the brushing your teeth example. You know, how many times do you have to tell your kids to brush your teeth, brush your teeth, brush your teeth? Did you brush your teeth? Go brush your teeth. So it's like that. Did you get your protein? How much protein did you get? Are you going to get your protein? Go eat some protein. Um, so it's going to be a lot of that until all of a sudden one day you don't have to hear my little voice in the back of your head saying, did you eat your protein? You automatically do it. Um, and I'm here for that accountability and support. I'm going to be that co-pilot for you. Um, and then working with me, we can always develop that plan for those weight management strategies, strategies that we talked about, that calories in versus calories out, the sleep, the stress management, um, looking at those macronutrients, looking at those micronutrients. Those do affect, uh, again, weight gain um, and body composition. This whole process of menopause and health and lifestyle changes is like a multifactorial, multidimensional. And so being able to work with a nutrition coach and a lifestyle coach, being able to have that psychological support for like the emotions and anxiety, and then being able to work with that medical doctor as a full team is gonna be the most beneficial for you. So taking, you know, there are people who are taking hormone replacements. There are supplements that individuals are taking, um, estrogen supplements or um, stuff like that. Those are all gonna, be incorporated into this new lifestyle along with nutrition and physical activity. So as you go through this menopause stage, um, there are a couple that make the top of the list, and this is really important for immunity and bone health. Those are calcium, vitamin D, and actually vitamin K. Um, vitamin D and vitamin K are fat soluble vitamins. So if you remember from the last seminar that I talked about, um, those are all really important um, uh, as far as helping the absorption of these vitamins. So you need that a little bit of fat for that. Um, but vitamin D and vitamin K along with calcium really helps slow down. It doesn't stop, it doesn't prevent, but it does help slow down that bone loss that you see um, with osteopenia and osteoporosis. And those are very similar. It's, there's just actually a very specific number that separates those two. Um, but those are, are gonna be the most important as far as um, helping with menopause. Um, there are some other uh, vitamins and supplements that might help with, um, you know, some of those signs and symptoms of like uh, night sweats and um, insomnia, but a lot of those you can really get through nutrition. Um, and that's like eating whole foods, you're going to get all the, those vitamins and nutrients. Um, there are just, again, those supplement, those smaller supplementations that may need to be added. And again, that's going to be up to the doctor um, and, and part of that nutrition counseling part of it. So metabolism is, there's a lot of components that go to that. So I'll try to keep this short because <laughs> I can talk to, talk about this. Um, so as we, as we get older, you heard me um, mention that we begin to lose muscle mass. Um, metabolism really works on, um, you know, the energy that it needs to keep muscles and organs working. 
So individuals with higher muscle mass, um, and I wish I had a, a chalkboard to draw on. So if you imagine this big bodybuilder who has all of this muscle, and then you imagine, you know, this really um, lean person who's really just skin and bone, the person with a higher muscle mass is going to have a higher metabolism because there is a more surface area. So your body has to um, uh, cr have more energy to keep that body functioning. So individuals who are, who are smaller, um, and if you ever track your calories and you're maybe 5'1", 5'2", or maybe my height, you're gonna notice that you're not gonna burn as many calories as someone who's six foot two, six foot three like John. So John and I have completely different metabolism and it's really based on body mass. Um, he's bigger, he weighs more than me, so his metabolism is going to be higher. So um, as we age, it really comes down to that loss of muscle mass um, versus because we get older, our metabolism slows. Um, so that's why it is really important, especially for women to, um, you know, keep working on that resistance training. Um, that's going to help us maintain that muscle mass so that our metabolism stays higher. It's also going to help us, um, you know, create that, that resistance that we need for maintaining bone health. It's also going to help us, you know, maintaining our weight. Um, so we don't continue to gain weight. Um, and again, nutrition plays a really big part in that. Uh, we really need more protein in our diet because we, that protein you know, helps us with growing muscle and uh, repairing that muscle. So it's sort of a two-factor component with that metabolism. So it's, it's both. Um, as we, so if we continue to eat, and I'm gonna use this as um, a, a really good example that we've all experienced is um, this pandemic and shelter in place. Uh, when we went into shelter in place, we stopped uh, going to the grocery store. We stopped walking to our car to you know, go to work. We stopped walking around work. So what happens is we took away that physical activity um, that we really didn't um, associate with physical activity, even though our body was moving and we still continued to eat the same. So our activity went down, we ate the same. And what most people said is like, oh, I gained that COVID-19, right? Um, and that is really because of that reduction in physical activity. If we maintain that physical activity as we were in this pandemic or shelter in place, you wouldn't have seen any weight change. You would have continued to go. So it's, it's um, really taking a look at what is my physical activity right now? What am I eating right now? Um, and what people tend to do is they underestimate how much they eat and they overestimate how much physical activity they get to. So until someone really looks at, hey, what are you doing? What are you really eating? Can you show me what you're eating? Then it's like, oh wait, okay, I'm not where I think I was. And that's really what it, what it, it comes down to. So, oh, um, okay, intermittent fasting. Um, that is something that I would love to have a conversation one-on-one -on -one with. This gets back into, I think the very first seminar when we talked about Restricting calories, um, uh, intermittent fasting, counting macros, keto diet, this all falls under these, the fad diets or these diet trends. Um, and what happens is that once you start that, because you're eating from this time to this time, you might actually see weight loss because you are restricting those calories from that time to that time. But what happens is we see an increase in anxiety and an unhealthy relationship with food. Um, that gets to the point where like, if you're gonna go to a birthday party or barbecue at the end of the night at 7 p.m. and you stopped eating at 6.30 p.m., you're gonna sit there and think about food and be like, oh man, I really wish I could have that piece of cake right now. Um, so it, it, um, there are ways that you can lose weight without counting macros, without doing intermittent fasting and, and have like, you know, those foods that you like, have, you know, a piece of pizza, have some ice cream, have a glass of wine. Um, like that. So if you would like to know a little bit more about intermittent fasting and how that works, definitely reach out to me at a later point because that's a full, whole, long conversation that I can have with you. If anyone wants to hop on a one-on-one -on -one call, we can talk about it because there's so many different options out there, especially when it comes to menopause. I can't tell you like doing research on this. Um, one, I've done research on it previously, but the more I look into it, there's just blogs and blogs and blogs out there. And you know, do this, do this, try this supplement. How about trying this? And it's so much information, really like trying to piece it together to like get to one final answer is really, really hard. And 
everyone's individually different. Um, you know, someone might do better on a low fat diet. Someone might do better on a low carb diet. Someone might do better on a low fat and low carb diet. Someone might, you know, there's so many different things out there. So without knowing that, um, that's why, you know, hopping on a call with me, asking about that, um, getting some more information and seeing what works for you is, is a really good option. Um, so again, Sarah at FitTrackCoaching.com. Um, those of you who have my number can always text me. Um, and again, I'll follow up. I'll uh, shoot everyone a text message uh, with some more information or the best way to get a hold of me if you have any other questions.